Uh, welcome and thank you for coming. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Peter and Ruth Nunn and the Quick Stop Pharmacy. Uh, our upcoming events include the holiday bus trip to Hagney Museum and Primitive Hall on Saturday, December 6th at 9 a.m. And our holiday open house here. The building will be fully decorated, as most of you know, and that is Friday, December 13th at 5 p.m. Tonight we'll hear from Dr. Ann Krulikowski speaking about workers' housing. Uh, Dr. Krulikowski earned her PhD in American history from the University of Delaware with a focus on material culture and historic preservation. She also has an MA in American history and British and American literature from Villanova University. She worked for five years at Rockwood Museum, a Victorian house in Wilmington, Delaware, where her responsibilities included overseeing house and school tours and developing public programs and special tours for children and adults. She has served on the board of the Friends of Rockwood and contributed to several reinterpretive projects of kitchen spaces and domestic technology and labor. Please welcome Dr. Krulikowski. Very nice. Well, thank you all for coming out on a rainy evening as we're starting to get into the dark in the winter. <laughs> so I appreciate it very much. So tonight I'm going to talk about, as you heard, um, industrial plan communities for workers and worker housing. Um, both that plan by individual companies. Um, I'm going to look over the course of the 19th century, and I could go on, but I'm going to end with World War I, because World War I introduces a new facet of worker housing and planned communities with the Emergency Fleet Corporation. So I'll end uh, with that here in Coatesville and one other nearby example for that. So I had long been interested in the history of housing and the house and the domestic environment, which is why I ended up working in a historic house museum for a while. And I was always going to Christmas tours and uh, taking tours of historic houses. And I was writing a dissertation actually on urban houses in Philadelphia about some working class neighborhoods. But as I be, and I never really thought about company towns or company housing that was planned for workers of a specific um, entity or organization. But as I was beginning to teach in 2002 and 2003, and I was looking for primary sources and things that would interest my students, I remember telling my nephew, you know, that I'm really struggling. What would you like to read? And he said, well, have you seen the movie October Sky? And I said, what's that? And it's about a boy building rockets. And I'm like, I hate space and rockets. The only thing I hate more is dinosaurs. They're just, I'm a pretty curious person, but they are two topics I have to say I have limited interest in. But it was one of those times where I, I just couldn't find anything else to watch. So I watched October Sky. I loved it. I went out the next day and got the book, which is an autobiography by Homer Hickam called The Rocket Boys. I read that in a day. Um, and the next semester, I ordered it for all my students to read <laughs> because they're still reading chapters of it. Um, they won't read the whole book anymore. Um, but this book, actually, so I thank my nephew. He's the one who got me interested in worker housing because this is about boys who live in a coal mining town in West Virginia, Colwood. And some of the images from the book are of worker housing. This is actually the Hickam house, and Mr. Hickam was a supervisor, so they had a rather large detached house in one of the better sections of of town, excuse me, they were a little farther from the plant, not near the railroad tracks. But then there was other housing for only semi-skilled workers, and you can see that's not necessarily in the most desirable area, particularly if you have young children, you, you don't like your front yard to be a railroad track. Mm -hmm. um, so this, in ca as I started thinking about the worker housing, I realized that a lot of the patterns that Homer Hickam talked about in the Rocket Boys, as I've been researching, I see that they're typical in many ways of many planned communities. Um, so there's a pattern where the house is, the location, the size, really reflects the hierarchy of workers in the workforce and the value of the worker to the company or the community. Um, so there are some of the patterns that I've seen. But I also look, of course, for um, are there communities or housing 
uh, for certain companies or at certain times that presents unique features um, where companies, and certainly there are many owners of industrial concerns that are also truly interested in philanthropy. Um, and so they have often devised many amenities that are a little bit more unusual for such communities. And then for those who study housing, a big argument is, does the free market offer better housing to people? Do housing reformers or does the federal government when that lays down guidelines? Um, I haven't found that there's all that much difference between those three entities, but that's something that I'll show you a few examples of. So this is a work in progress. If you know of examples, yourself that you can share with me with me or you know more specifics about housing right here in Coatesville. I really appreciate knowing about it. Um, so what I found out as I started to research was that planned housing for industrial workers really had its roots in housing, planned housing for agricultural workers. Um, because one thing that large landed estates in England had in common with, say, coal mines or lumbering companies was that they're in the country or in the middle of nowhere. So there's nowhere for the workers to live. So we start to see planned, basically, company housing on large landed estates in England with what were called tied cottages. And they were called tied cottages because they were the cottages, the housing was tied to the estate. It wasn't owned by the worker, it was only rented by the worker, although most estates allowed workers to, to rent it for very minimal sums of money. Um, but any remodeling, any changes, any updating were undertaken by the landowner at his discretion uh, when he could afford it or when he was willing to. And so because they were rented and because they depended on your ability to rent, depended on your employment and being actively employed, they also tied the worker to the job. Um, and it made it very difficult for workers if they were inclined to, to search around for other types of job. But I have found examples where um, obviously some of the, the owners were very philanthropic they were always devising plans for improvements of the tied cottages. Many landowners, perhaps most, allowed elderly workers to continue to reside even when they were no longer providing services for the estate. So this is England, but I also think that um, housing for enslaved people um, in the South, or at one time, obviously, up and down the East Coast, is also a form of tied cottage. Um, because plantations were in the countryside and they had to provide housing for workers of better or lesser quality. And so here are some plantation houses that survive from the McLeod Plantation, which is outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And because there's actually more, obviously more of an element of control here, even when plantations, and there were many plantations in southern cities like Charleston, where a big house and a, a family would basically have a whole block, but in the backyard were slave quarters. Um, so even in the urban environment, slave owners tended to provide housing because they wanted full control and they didn't want to allow their enslaved people to live elsewhere, but in their property. So agricultural housing is really the forerunner of housing that was provided for industrial workers. Um, in the United States, the first real noticeable attempts to provide housing for workers was in the early textile mills around Lowell, Massachusetts mm -hmm. and in Rhode Island. And in the textile mills in that section of the country, a huge part of the workforce by the 1820s and 1830s were young single women. And for those textile companies to convince families to let their daughters leave home, live with strangers, they also had to show that their daughters would still be respectable, mm -hmm. that somebody would be imposing some boundaries, as we say today, um, and keeping an eye on them. And so com these companies in the countryside built what become larger and larger, basically dormitories. They're almost forerunners of college dorms in some ways. And the, the picture in the lower corner is a picture of um, the Boots Mill, which was near Lowell, 
um, in the 1870s. And in the picture, there are some male workers, but they lived in different sections. These were boarding houses strictly for females, and they were strictly for white native-born female workers. No foreign workers were allowed to live in these boarding houses. It wasn't until after the Civil War when young native-born women were getting more education and there were other types of job opportunities. There were the, big, the large emporium stores that were the forerunners of department stores. There were more retail opportunities um, and so on. And they sought those types of jobs and young immigrant women started to look for jobs in the textile mills. So it really wasn't until after the Civil War that many of these companies allowed foreign born girls to live in the boarding houses. And that's a theme that we'll see again and again with much industrial housing that native born workers were generally segregated from the foreign born workers and for what were called in the late 19th and early 20th century the colored workers as well. So there was a lot of segregation in the, the housing. Uh, but the lower boarding houses, uh, a house or a dorm might house 30 to 40 young women who are under the watch of a housekeeper or a house mother who lived there. And the first floor would have a dining room, a kitchen, sometimes a gathering room or a little study parlor for the girls to enjoy some community life and um, quarters for the, the den mother or the house mother. And then the upper floors <coughs> would have bedrooms for the young girls. Mm. But there wasn't a lot of privacy. The girls were housed in bedrooms of four to eight mm. apiece. Um, so there weren't private quarters or private apartments yeah. for the workers. Uh, but this is a step um, towards worker housing. And of course, by the 1830s, even the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, we see lots of mills being founded in this area, in Philadelphia, Conshohocken, Manioc, Roxborough, Kensington, um, which was actually the center of textile manufacturing, not New England. Um, and then in Delaware County, um, in many townships, along Darby Creek, there were many paper mills, grist mills, um, textile mills as well. Down in Wilmington, we see Hagley, the gunpowder mill, uh, being founded. And so they, all of these mills were out in the countryside too. Um, in the city, it wasn't so much of a problem. Workers had to fend for themselves with the real estate market, whatever they could find. But along the Darby Creek in Delaware County, or at Hagley Powder Mill, the companies had to provide housing for the workers. But this is before really large scale industrialization. We're not talking about the, the size of workforce that a steel company would have after the, the Civil War or a coal mine company. They generally had the largest workforces. Shipyards more so during a time of war. Uh, but even they generally had slightly smaller workforces. So they're set in the countryside, and as this postcard shows, some of these early worker villages, at first glance, it looks like just a bucolic, early American mm -hmm. ideal town. Why wouldn't you leave Europe and come here to live in something like this? It's just beautiful. Um, it's not the industrial town that we really think of. Um, but there were boarding houses for single men. In this area, it tended to be families who were hired by textile mills. So many family members signed contracts. Um, so there was houses provided for families, not the dorms that we see in New England uh, for young women. That wasn't characteristic of the mills here. But here, even in bucolic villages like that, children as young as three and four might work a few hours a day because there were certain tasks that they could do. Not that their families were mean, but they weren't making enough to support them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the founders, uh, Rockdale might be one of the most famous examples, it was textile mills founded by John Crozier, um, who was an entrepreneur and businessman of the time. Um, many of the, the worker towns that had a philanthropic um, goal to provide some more amenities were a Quaker. Um, Crozier was not a Quaker. I think he was maybe Baptist. Um, but he was certainly motivated to provide not just houses but amenities. So there was a town hall. There was a school for children. Uh, there was green spaces for children to play in. So he was certainly concerned with not providing just a house. 
but providing for a whole experience for his workers, um, which is unusual in most cases because this was an era where many mill owners referred to the people who worked in the mill not as people, not as men and women, but as hands, right? Because it was a way to dehumanize them or think of them as just part of the machinery. So Rockdale, Rockvale um, becomes um, a kind of a stellar early small scale experiment to provide model conditions for workers. And um, another example, as we see the beginning of some serious coal mining in Pennsylvania. And of course, coal mine towns, just like steel towns, have environmental consequences because of the type of economy. So there are always going to be environmental circumstances that are going to negatively impact people who work there because of the, the level of smoke, um, the, the way the landscape has to be treated in order to mine the coal that make them obviously look less bucolic. Um, even when mill and factory owners are really trying their best to provide decent housing for their workers. Um, so Summit Hill, which is in Carbon County, Pennsylvania, was an early coal mining town. Um, but even in the, the postcard, if you can see, it's not a whole lot beyond what you just saw for Delaware County. It's just a step beyond. This is still pre-Civil War. So we're not talking about the level of industrialization afterwards that Alucans or um, companies in Coatesville would eventually have. Um, but it was a coal mining town. And once uh, uh, the Lehigh Navigation Company started operating it and bringing coal down to Philadelphia, they really wanted to increase the number of workers. And so they started buying property and building houses for their employees. There wasn't a lot of thought to amenities, um, but the houses were certainly many steps above what an average worker in Philadelphia mm -hmm. was finding at the time. So it certainly was good quality housing. But you can see an up close view, there's no street grading, there's not a lot of vegetation, there's no attempt to plant a yard. Mm -hmm. Although again, this is before the Civil War, this is before lawn culture becomes um, a big part of American culture. Um, and it's about this time in the 1830s that we know that uh, Rebecca Lukens, after she took over Lukens, um, did give some attention to providing tenement houses. And this is a picture that I found. That I think this one is from Hagley Museum. And it's labeled on the back, houses for tenants. Mm -hmm. um, so Although the foreground, again, there's not a lot of landscaping, you can see the houses are sizable. I can't really tell if they're twins um, or they're multifamily houses, but they're clearly sizable. They appear to be of stone rather than just frame, although it's not a great quality photograph. And there was some level of detail of finishing in the interior because reported in the accounts are, I think, $27 for a workman, I forget his name, who did lathing and plastering in the interior. So they're not bare walls. There's some attempt to provide a finish um, and paint over the plaster to make them more homey for the workers. So here at Lukens, there was some attempt um, to provide some housing for the workers. I can't remember if it's this photograph or another, um, that it was mentioned on the back of the photograph that most of the tenant houses, oh, it's a later one, so I'll save that. Oh, it's this one. Mm -hmm. um, this photograph was taken in 1890. This is another photograph I found at Hagley, and it's tenant houses. It's labeled tenant houses for the Lukens Company. Um, I think it's probably, they were built probably a little earlier, maybe the 1870s or 80s. And it's a row, and that was typical using short rows not the length of a row that you would see, say, in a city like Philadelphia, where you could have 40 row houses on a one block if you're really trying to cram them in. And you can see there is, by 1890, um, a bit of a playground. Sliding board. Yeah. Um, and I meant to look up when the sliding board was invented. But it's only in 1888 or 1899 that the first playground in America is created at, by the settlement workers at Hull House in Chicago. 
they create the first playground for children in Chicago. So this is pretty early. So somebody's paying attention to new trends um, in taking care of workers in the working class um, that there is space for children to play on uh, by some time in the 1890s. On the back of this photograph is a note that the tenant house was for these tenant houses were for foreign-born workers here in Lugans because the, it said the American-born could find houses in Coatesville, which was in walking distance. So they could find houses from other landlords to buy or to rent. Although the note on the back of this photograph said the great majority of skilled workers were actually paying mortgages. Mm -hmm. So they were paid enough that they could afford to, to get a mortgage mm -hmm. and attempt home ownership. Um, but it might be that the foreign workers, people wouldn't rent to them, or that they probably were unskilled workers as well Maybe they didn't make enough to be able to pay rent um, in town. Was there, a, was there a language problem between foreign work and the uh, and American? Well, I was just, I, I've always wondered that, but I just got some information uh, before that there, there was. And um, Jim was telling me that workers, if you had a foreman mm -hmm. in charge of you who was Ukrainian mm -hmm. or something, you had to learn that foreman's mm -hmm. language to be able to operate safely. Uh -huh. Did you want to comment some more? No, I think that sums it up beautifully. Okay, yeah, which was very interesting to me it because is. that's something, there's very, although all history books talk about the language problem and they don't know language, nobody, I don't think, has ever investigated how these factories actually operated with people speaking all these different languages. Yeah. I think if you were Polish and they hired you and to I your am Polish. side, <laughs> so what, and they assigned you to the group that was the, Polish. the Polish foreman mm -hmm. ran, <clears throat> and each group would do a certain job, like run a shears or mm -hmm. uh, do a certain task, and then that group were the Italians or the Germans or the Polish people. Mm -hmm. And that makes perfect sense. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then some, I know from some of my relatives um, that those who grew up speaking Polish, they, could, they couldn't speak Russian, but they could understand it. Mm -hmm. So I guess there was overlap, too, in some of the languages mm -hmm. um, that were more similar to each other, I which also helped. I heard that they were kind of responsible for their own hiring. Mm -hmm. So if that crew needed a new person, they would go to their community and bring someone in and maintain the level of manning for that crew. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's very practical. Because, of course, employers in other countries didn't have to deal with those facets of production. Um, and then I think this is interesting. This is a photograph I found. Uh, I think it's slightly later. I think it was dated to about 1900. But it's not worker housing, um, it, although they did work, um, the Houstons. But one thing that is very much a pattern in the United States and not a pattern in England, and I don't think in European countries like France and Germany, um, was that the head of the company lived on the site of the plant. And this is the kind of scene you usually see worker housing. Because reformers never took these kinds of pictures that showed the owner housing. They focused on how the workers were so close to the plant and so close to the smokestacks. But in this country, except for the extraordinarily wealthy like Carnegie, um, who didn't live on in Homestead or on the plant site. It was typical that Mer American, they had bigger houses, but they lived right on the plant and they had the same kinds of living mm -hmm. conditions for the most part that the workers did. Um, that's unheard of in Europe. They all lived somewhere else and somewhat. Yeah, it's interesting, the house on the right was my, uh, it's no longer there. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, my grandfather's house. The other one on the other side was, was actually, well actually, was, uh, yeah, and then that one was, was his father's house. And mm -hmm. that was Dr. Charles Houston on that yes. one. That still, mm -hmm. that still exists. Mm -hmm. We have seen it in the daytime. So that's why I feature that, even though it's not worker housing, um, because it's very unusual. Um, and it's typical of the United States for that to occur. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's look at England, because England had started to industrialize a little earlier 
And even by the 1820s and 30s, when mill towns are just really beginning to dot the landscape here, there are cities like Liverpool and Birmingham and Manchester and London that people already think of as districts you don't want to go anywhere near that are black, they're um, they're filthy, people are breathing in soot, the people who live there and work there look different because they're so malnourished and suffering from all kinds of physical problems. And so the some of the philanthropists in England who own companies, and some of them, are, many are Quakers, are inspired to do something and to create better housing conditions. So one village that becomes a very important model that American manufacturers will look at is Salt Air. And Salt Air is now a world land, heritage landmark because it marks a turning point in worker housing and planning worker housing. It was built near um, Bradford, which was a town in uh, Yorkshire, which was again one of these ter cities with a terrible reputation uh, for the conditions that people lived and worked in. And as you can see, it was built, a lot of it is row houses, or what the British call terrace houses. Um, and it was built out of local stone, local Yorkshire stone. Um, but salt air, but you can see there are little yards where there's greenery. They're English, so no matter how small the house was, you got a little garden to plant. Because um, it was a very important cultural component for workers, too. There actually have been recently some books written on working class gardening habits. and. Uh, the Does culture salt of it. Mean anything? Does it um, come from anything? Yes, um, Sir Titus Salt was the creator. Um, he owned textile mills, in, and he actually became mayor of Bradford for a while. And while he was mayor, he tried to introduce a piece of machinery to get factory owners to use it to clean up the air. He didn't have any success. After he was mayor, he he didn't leave any documentation about why he did this or how he thought of it. He created Salt Air outside of Bradford as a model working community. And I can't remember if the air relates to the river that was nearby, because a lot of these towns were near rivers um, and so on. But it was Sir Titus Salt um, who Great was name. the inventor. Yes, very biblical. Um, so Salt Air becomes a model. Um, there is housing that reflects a hierarchy for skilled workers. There are semi-detached houses. For superintendents, there are detached houses. But in many of these English communities, and we won't really see this in the United States at all, um, or in very limited example, everybody got landscaping. Everybody got a bit of green space. And there were community features like parks, green spaces, trees delivered. Um, community buildings with theaters and so on so that a gymnasium he had a gymnasium there for people to get exercise beyond work so all kinds of amenities that were enjoyed by the workers of all levels so salt air provides a real model and then the other English model that becomes very important in the United States is Port Sunlight mm -hmm. and this was a village outside of Liverpool and build itself, as you can see, the model village of England, but it was a working village for the workers of the soap company owned by the Lever brothers. Um, and Sir, the person who becomes Sir Lever, Sir Leverholm. Um, this was really interesting experiment and does become a model too for a number of American experiments that they try to lessen the impact of monotony and people feeling uh, anonymous, like there are 500 others who live in exactly the same house. Mm -hmm. He hired 30 different architects mm -hmm. to design different styles of housing. And there are experiments in the United States where business owners will do that, but all the styles for the unskilled are exactly the same. And then there's a different style of architecture for the semi-skilled. So very visibly, there's a hierarchy. But here, he'll use Tudor for houses of managers, supervisors, skilled, unskilled, semi-skilled. So the style of the house is in a dead giveaway. The, the size is, but you have to look twice. And it was a collection of terraced houses, as you see here, but not in the block-long vistas that we have in Philadelphia, where there will be hundreds of blocks adjacent to each other, which really give that claustrophobic feeling. There's one block of tourist houses, and it's a wider street. 
and they have setbacks from the streets so that you have a little green space, a little separation. Um, so uh, Port Sunlight becomes an incredible experiment. And again, gyms, parks, playgrounds, a public library, a schoolhouse, an art gallery, a center square. There's nobody who wouldn't enjoy living here. Uh, but of course, it's a little bit more possible because of the industry he's in. Not that making soap didn't result in any pollution um, to the air and the water and the ground, but not to the level that coal companies or steel plants do. So they're always limited in what they can provide just by the nature um, of the work they do. And then there are other examples I'm not going to talk about a lot, but New Earswick and Bourneville, which are created right around the turn of the 20th century, are two other planned communities for workers. These are um, chocolate companies, um, and they're both owned by Quaker families um, who were long interested and had a history of philanthropy. So we see that really repeated with Rebecca Lukens here. Um, in Philadelphia, there's a very interesting experiment um, in the early 1870s. This is one of the few model worker towns, and it was created to be a bit of a model. Not all worker towns were intended to be a model. They were simply to provide housing. In some cases, decent, solid housing, but they weren't intended to set the world on fire, um, as an example. But in the Tony Tacony section of Philadelphia, in the middle of developing neighborhoods, Henry Diston, who owned the Keystone Saw Works, wanted to provide better housing for his workers. And he believed better housing than they would be able to get from the real estate market. And so he bought up acreage, and it's along the Delaware River. City Hall is several miles to the south. So this is in North Philadelphia. Frankfurt is even below here, if, if you're familiar with um, this area. And you can see it was in a combination of farms but developing neighborhoods when he purchased this. And he built hundreds of houses um, for the workers at the Distant Soul Works. And it's a little, it's even today if you go up, you can tell you're in a kind of a different neighborhood. It fits into the city grid, but the streets are a little wider even the streets with row houses. And where there's a block of row houses for unskilled workers, the next block has semi-detached. So it doesn't repeat the row house after row house kind of format. But like every other industrial community for workers, it's a mix of detached homes, semi-detached row houses in various styles and sizes. Um, based on the skill of worker and how much the worker made, how much the worker could pay in rent. Um, a lot of these houses, like in many company communities, were rented. Workers were not allowed to own them. The distant company actually started selling lots <coughs> after a while to families so that they could contract with a builder or a lumberyard because they felt it kept morale up and created loyalty when workers could own their own housing um, and reduce resentment um, if, if there were any. Um, so it turned out to be a very um, viable experiment. Would, would the company attempt to buy the homes back so that their workers continue to have access to those homes once they had sold uh, them originally? That's a good question. And from the few deeds that I've looked at so far, um, it seems like people weren't allowed to sell them to anybody other than company employers, so employees. So mostly it works the other way. Eventually, like at Port Sunlight, employers, at, at sooner or later, the company will release and sell the houses to the workers um, at some point. But it now, obviously, um, there was court action because the company folded so mm -hmm. there, there were no employers and they hadn't really thought about that far in the future maybe didn't want to think about a time when that would happen but <clears throat> while the company was there people who owned the properties couldn't sell them to anybody but the company or other company employees because um, they wanted a community and they did provide other amenities they built churches and they sold land at I think 75% off to congregations who wanted to build churches um, they created some playgrounds and parks and they really wanted those things available only to company employees what about schools 
they did build schools in, in Taconi in that section. So just like planned communities that were separated, um, they did. And at first it was only um, children of employees of the company who attended those schools. And the not the school board, the school district, but the company hired the teachers. So that was another amenity. They paid for the teachers. And typically, how long would a child attend school for? At what age would they be out of the school? Um, 14. Um, it was very rare, um, even for, except for the small middle class that you would stay in school till you were about 16. Um, I think that becomes typical for Americans in the 1920s, so um, not all that, not even 100 years ago, that most children, we expect, we send truant officers out to keep them in school. So children of the working class, much less, even after the child labor laws are passed at the turn of the century. Many working class families and immigrant families resist them because they need the children to go out and contribute to the income. So about, especially for boys, 12 or 13. In the 19th century, girls got more schooling than boys because, well, work was dangerous, work was physical, work was dirty. Because of gender distinctions, it seemed better to send the boys out. It was practical. Girls weren't going to get those jobs. Yeah. So, and here's a block of, of row houses, which looks bare, but originally there was a tree planted in front of every single row house. Um, so, and then the blocks on either side are not row houses. The row house blocks are really spaced out to avoid becoming like the rest of Philadelphia and that feeling of claustrophobia. And, there, and notice that they're up, they're set back, they're up. Many of the row house districts in Philadelphia, the houses are very close to the street, they're one step up, they're at street level, which makes them feel very claustrophobic. And if you've been in Philadelphia, this is a narrow street, but it's not the narrowest that a house can be on. So this is fairly generous for an industrial section of Philadelphia. Um, the big one example in the United States of a model community, although one of the worst strikes in American history happened here, um, was the town of Pullman in Chicago. Um, Pullman had a factory in Detroit, but he was a longtime Chicago resident. And after labor difficulties, he wanted to build a new plant and hire an essentially different workforce. And so he purchased land south of Chicago um, and built um, a model town, uh, the town of Pullman. And he sent his architect over to England and the architect examined salt air, um, which was earlier, and examined the Lever Brothers town was still to come, but also went to Germany and France to look at a few towns. So he clearly wanted to study the best models and he clearly was motivated to provide some amenities uh, for the workers. You can see that uh, a lot of the houses were row houses. The Pullman Works was right next door, so the houses were adjacent. Um, there was a big hotel. Most of these communities have hotels, they're for visiting executives, but also for um, unmarried men, because not everybody was married, and there had to be boarding houses or hotels for unmarried men to live in. And there was a community building, there was a school. You've seen Pullman, if you've ever seen the movie The Fugitive with Harrison Ford, has anybody seen that? Do you remember Sykes, the one-armed man? He lives in Pullman, that's Pullman. Oh. Um, and where Harrison Ford's running over the roof after it, that's the town of Pullman, and there's some workers' <coughs> houses. So you get to see a little glimpse of it in that movie. Um, and this is a view of what it looked like along the river uh, when it was built. And just another piece of local history, the Pullman Church was actually built out of local Chester County Green serpentine mm. stone, um, probably the most famous building ever built out of this local stone. Just those two sides, the other sides yeah, are brick. But that was the center. You can't see because the buildings obscure it. There's a, a wide boulevard down the center of Pullman with a green space, which was part of a park. There was a school, there was a theater building for concerts, so there were all these types of amenities. But the housing very much, as elsewhere, uh, reflected your value to the company. So this is executive row um, for executives in the company who were expected to live in the company town just a block from semi-skilled workers and skilled workers. So they were all there, 
on different blocks and they all use the same parks and green spaces. Um, but you can see these are quite the large. Mm -hmm. Did um, these people hire architects to, mm -hmm. and did they hire famous architects or just work a day guys? Um, a lot of them hire famous um, architects. Solon Beeman was from New Jersey. He wasn't necessarily hugely known before Pullman. And I think it's, I've researched because of my serpentine stone research to try to find out why Sol and Beeman used the stone. It seems like Pullman, these industrialists are friends, they meet, and it seems like somebody recommended, he had done a country house for somebody in New Jersey. Uh -huh. And so he was given a town to design, which was a step up the architectural ladder for him. What was the population of the town? Um, when it was complete, I think it had about 4,000 people at its height. So it was sizable, not the largest, but a fairly sizable town. A town like Homestead, which I'll show you in a minute, had 25,000. Wow. Yeah. Now, do they provide shops and things like that? Yes, they did. And in that arcade building, I should have mentioned, and that's typical, that was typical of Port Sunlight, Salt Air, that there would be an arcade with retail establishments as well. Um, because these, and they allowed, they weren't necessarily company stores, although some company stores operated very fairly. Um, Colwood with the Rocket Boys, they were paid in scrip they couldn't it's not like you could save money and leave you had to spend it in the company store if you saved it you couldn't use it they rented space to individual retailers who aren't necessarily company employees um, and they set the prices so it wasn't like company stores company stores although not all company stores are the same um, so the architects clearly, um, and you never know until you read in detail into their papers what the ideas of the architects or the landscape planners are, where the factory owner has said, do this, do that, I want to see this, I want to see that. So it's always a lot of compromise. But you can see there are blocks of rows. Um, there are semi-detached there are larger and smaller semi-detached, larger and smaller attached, and so on. But there's green spaces, there's sidewalks and green, which separate you from the street. Um, this is kind of an unfair picture because this is in the first year, so you don't get the full effect of the planting that was planned. The trees, it looks wintry, the trees are small. Um, but this actually grew to be quite, um, nice here although within sight of the company and there's still a few steps going up it's set back um, to give you some privacy here's an early picture that shows tree-lined streets because um, they planted trees to make it green yeah yeah he graded it there were modern utilities um, so in that way as a very model town Pullman starts in the early 1870s um, and builds, uh, I think they're still building some houses maybe in the 1890s. So it had a long building. Um, as he could, um, you know, he would build sections of it at a time as the plant expanded. There, a number of the early or, or even later English worker communities mm -hmm. do not have indoor plumbing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in Tacconi and Pullman and so on, I'm assuming that they put in their own um, water systems and, and sewer systems? In Tacconi, they did. Um, in Pullman, um, I think they did have indoor running water, not a bathroom so to speak, but they didn't have outhouses. Um, so they had some kind of indoor room. I don't think they had modern toilets were in, around at that time, um, although they had some problems. So I'm not, exa actually, I'm not exactly sure. And I don't see, it, particularly in the floor plans of the smallest houses, which are the ones I've looked at, there's not there are closets, which were unusual in some of these, even to be given closets to store things. But I think I recently read that there was a closet downstairs with running water, 
but a couple of houses would share the same pipe so you didn't necessarily get gushes of water but it was downstairs so they were i think they were still filling up a wash tub in the kitchen to bathe in even in the early 1900s mm -hmm. some of the factory terraced towns in england or within yeah, don't. Pl places like liverpool mm -hmm. the water runs down is in the a backyard alley behind and you only have the, the tap, the faucet in the kitchen at, at the back. Yeah. And there is a toilet at the back as well. Yeah. They didn't have the money for that infrastructure over there that people did have here. And Americans really, by the 1880s and the 1890s, they're really starting to boast about their like infrastructure, modern services. They also see it, I think one thing that gives impetus to the development of that here is they're talking about dirty immigrants or people who don't keep clean and for the so it's a way to bring the immigrant to heel in some cases or show the modern standards or American standards. So I mm -hmm. think there's I think it's the immigrant workforce that is partly the impetus for finding the money for that kind of infrastructure. You mentioned water in a closet. The first bathrooms mm -hmm. were called water closets. Right, right, yeah. But I don't know if they just had a jar in there. I don't think they had flush toilets. I've never seen any evidence. But I should uh, have to look more carefully. And certainly in the floor plans for the smalls, you don't see that at all. But I don't remember, I've been through their archives, I don't remember seeing any photographs of outhouses mm -hmm. at Pullman. And they did have small backyards, so but I don't see that at all. So there must have been some accommodation inside. But in but that's a good question because in terms of those kinds of services, Americans were far ahead of the English. The English, they gave gardens and trees. I mean, and I'm not saying that's bad but, because but I I would like that. Not in the back back housing. I'm right. And even in Bradford okay. today. Right. Yeah. There are occupied back to back houses. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing. Um, there was a fellow in, in Chestnut Hill, um, George Woodward, who was also a doctor and developed some of Chestnut Hill and developed housing for working class people, although it wasn't a housing community. He hated backyards, as a lot of architects did, and they didn't think the working class knew how to take care of a backyard, that they just let it become a, a dumping ground. Mm -hmm. So he developed the quadruple back-to-back uh -huh. -back twins, um, so there was no backyard, and you couldn't have a backyard. But I know they tried that in England, where it was more popular. Here, it really didn't catch on. And in England, they had a, quadruples had a reputation. People died living in them because they became damp and stuff like that. So he actually reported at an international conference, housing conference, that as far as he knew or he could testify and provide evidence, nobody had ever died in Chestnut Hill <laughs> in a quadruple. And I'm sure nobody did <laughs> in Chestnut Hill. Wasn't it also that there's just more real estate in America than there is in England? I mean, we just have more land. Yeah, although here... When it came to workers' houses, we really crammed them in, and the English give even this, not in cities like Bradford or Manchester, not in cities, but in the developments that are outside of cities. They give even the smallest houses more space. In England? Yeah. 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 And at Pullman, actually, until the 1970s, Everybody who lived in Pullman was either native born or an immigrant, but white, or at what came to be called white, um, because at first Italians were not considered white. Um, they were people of color, but the, the village only starts changing over in the 1970s. If you were black and worked for the Pullman company, and they did have a small black for workforce, generally unskilled labor, um, you had to find your own accommodations outside of the district of, of Pullman. Uh, but about half, while the Pullman Company operated, about half the workforce was foreign-born, half was native-born. But the native-born, according to the statistics, almost all of them had one or two foreign-born parents. So they were first generation and very close to the immigrant experience working for Pullman. So this is an interior of one of the houses. And then I put, because a lot of um, companies did have retail stores, I mean, they had to provide this as a service. I just recently came across this picture of the employee cooperative store here at Lukens, and this is a picture 
um, from 1925, but since I came across it recently, I don't really know too much about it. Do you know anything about the Lukens Company store? Or? The store, yeah, it was, it mm -hmm. was um, quite, quite uh, busy. It had uh, groceries on the first floor mm -hmm. and dry goods on the second. And we've had some wonderful stories uh, by uh, former Lukens employees about mm -hmm. using the badge number of the employee uh -huh. and the family could be provided for. Mm -hmm. uh, and the employee would re excuse me, receive a payday, whatever was left over. Mm -hmm. uh, so some very, very interesting stories about that. Oh, so it was like using the badge as a charge card almost, right. like, and interesting. Yeah. Where was the store? Uh, about 100 or 200 yards to the south of us. So before Rebecca's house? It enclosed Rebecca's house. house. Was part of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then the other, besides Pullman, the other nationally known worker village in the United States, never intended to be a model of anything, was Andrew Carnegie's town of Homestead outside of Pittsburgh. Um, Homestead had begun developing earlier, um, but he bought one of the largest mills there in the early 1880s. And when he did that, he formed the Carnegie Land Company and began purchasing land to create um, a mill town for workers. So here you see, and this is typical, it has the wor the workers living uh, very close. He himself did not live there uh, like the Houstons did here live on the site or Rebecca um, Lukens. Um, and you can see the houses are framed uh, very closely set together, although they do have little yards um, and they obviously have rear yards, um, so there is some amenity, certainly a step up from many row house neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Um, these are what were called detached dwellings of the better type for skilled workers. So you can see that they have a little bit of a yard. Um, they resemble a little bit more maybe a suburban house of the time period. Um, so a few more amenities a little farther from the plant. Um, too. But Homestead was not policed. It didn't have a lot of amenities like a theater and stuff like that. So alleyways did develop um, where the unskilled workers lived because they really struggled um, to make ends meet. And then Homestead was a, um, a town of 25,000 people. This was the only playground um, that was available to those children. So the amenities were slight here. The rest of them were working. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. So I'm gonna just skip ahead. Um, I just found this recently. Of course, boarding houses and hotels for single workers were critical in a lot of these communities because not everybody was married. And I just came across this in a, a literary news kind of magazine about the Lukens Mission Boarding House, uh, which was here on the property. And um, according to the article in 1912, 1913, the company really had trouble get, this is according to the article, getting unskilled workers, which it needed. There were always jobs for unskilled workers at factories and plants. Um, and so the head policeman had the idea of going to rescue missions in Philadelphia <laughs> to find men who were recovering alcoholics who needed a second opportunity. So according to the article, over the next couple of years, they were able to recruit a total of about 800 men wow. Uh, about 400 of which lasted at the job for any length of time. Um, but this boarding house, it was one of the older houses on the site, was expanded and remodeled. So it could house 40 of these men because a lot of local landlords weren't willing to take these men in since they had been known to have alcohol problems and, and so on. But it was, it was, the article was entitled Coatesville's Holy Experiment um, after William Penn's, you know, green country town. Um, so I thought it was, this is a unique instance of something that I found. And of course, Coatesville had just gone dry. Um, I think a lot at the um, instigation or inspiration of the company, because it was something that many industrialists, alcoholism was a major problem. It also meant that work was more unsafe because if people were tipsy or had hangovers, they didn't pay attention. And industrialization meant that people had to pay attention to what they were we're doing. Um, so it becomes very unsafe on the job. And then World War I, and we see the government enter the show uh, with housing. And the government, although many historians argue that the government 
uh, provided better housing than um, capitalist um, endeavors would. I found that the the Emergency Fleet Corporation of World War One actually imposed a lot of the same uh, requirements on Midvale Steel and other companies. So Midvale Steel, and this includes hierarchy of housing and segregation of workers based on skill and based on race. The government mandates that. Um, and so Midvale Steel, of course, as you all know, comes into uh, Coatesville right around World War I. And because of the wartime emergency, many shipyards and steel companies, they have to find workforces immediately and they have to provide housing for them. So Midvale Steel purchases about 100 acres in South Coatesville. Um, and it's a farm and it's very steep, but it's the only property they could get of any size. It really was a lot of it unsuitable. Um, the architect reported in an architectural journal that the grade was 15 to 20 percent of a slope. Some of it was even, you couldn't even have a road on it um, because it was just too steep for cars. Um, but it was the only property they could get and they needed workers to fight the war. Um, so they hire an architect who is also a town planner and try to create the best community they can. You can see examples of some of the houses, but clearly there's some distinction between skilled and unskilled. The skilled workers had, and this is what the Emergency Fleet Corporation, they're very specific. This is what you give. Skilled workers get house A or house B. Semi-skilled, if they're native-born, get this. If they're semi-skilled and farm-born, they get that. Um, very clear distinctions. Um, so there are steps up. There's actually a very wide sidewalk kind of Tudor details, so some architectural style there, as opposed to the square smaller, but you do get a tree. And again, it's better than what a lot of Philadelphians had in industrial districts. And then in the middle were the image from the, that advertised the talk um, was a snippet of this picture. These were mechanics houses, the lower end of the skilled the upper end of the semi-skilled. But you can see the architect was trying to work with the slope and devise a more attractive, amenable living situation. He has trees drawn in and it looks like a park across the street. The image doesn't quite give the same ambiance because of the slope of the ground. It's also an unfair photograph because it's right after the houses were built. The greenery has not filled in and it's also winter time. Um, but you can see what the architect was trying to, to do here. And then the government told Midvale Steel, you know, obviously you're going to need unskilled workers. One of the first sections you have to build was called the Brandywine section, and it was strictly for foreign laborers um, because the Emergency Fleet Corporation, the foreign laborers did not get mixed in with native born. Um, and so this was a sketch of the plan. And again, there's some discrimination because some of the foreign laborers were actually skilled or semi-skilled, not all were unskilled. But they're all semi-detached houses, but of three different sizes, reflecting the skill. But it was they were built closer to the river, um, away from what was the most considered to be the most desirable property for workers. And you can see some of the houses under construction, but this was not the corporation. This was the emergency. This was the federal government. Baked in the prejudice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but one other experiment from the local. It's my last example. Was Union Park Gardens, which was a World War One community built in Wilmington. Uh, but here it was a couple of shipyards that were working together. This was for shipyard workers, and they had the good fortune or the emergency fleet mistakenly appointed John Nolan to be the architect and town planner. John Nolan's one of the most fabulous town planners and he really wanted to create a model landscape here for workers. Um, and so even his sketch gives you, this harkens back to Port Sunlight um, and so on. And he designed it kind of like a suburb um, with some curving streets, although it had to fit in, uh, it had to connect with the Wilmington Street system. But there's a parkway with trees running through the center of it. There are wide boulevards. There are several parks, even though it's a fairly small neighborhood. Um, and again, this doesn't give you the, uh, it's right after it's built, so you don't see the full effect of all of the greenery and the tree planting that was brought in. And I will say Midvale Steel, not the government, insisted on bringing in here to Coatesville 
the architect said that 100 farm property, there was not one tree on it when Midvale Steel purchased it. And Midvale Steel insisted that there was a massive tree planting program once the houses were built, um, to their credit. But you can see that Union Park Gardens, because of the insistence of the architect, um, and he seemed to have been backed up by the, the shipyard companies. These houses are tiny, though. Um, there are some that are a little bit bigger, but the average room size was 11 by 12, and four rooms or five rooms if you have six. So people who live in there today talk about them being, therefore people who want a, the tiny house movement uh, or people, and they say the only thing that makes them livable is there is a basement where they keep almost everything they own. Um, so it, that was an extraordinary kind of contrast to some of the World War I housing. So obviously it's a much longer story that comes up to the present, but I've talked for a very long time, so. That'll be the end of my story tonight. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Mm -hmm. Where would Midville be? Where is it today? You know what? I'm not sure. Okay. And I was going to come early so I could go out and pace around again to find it. Um, but it was already raining when I came. And, uh, Does anybody, anybody local? Sometimes any local people Midville. are Midville. great Midville. sources. Midville is and Worth Brothers. And yeah. This community is south, is south here. Yeah. And it included in the original plans a community center, um, like a city hall, mm -hmm. about five community buildings, a library. I don't think all of them were built. I think only three of them were built. Yeah, and that's, you know, the emergency fleet, once the war is over, they pull out, they pull the funding. Houses are stopped. There were blocks in Philadelphia for Hog Island that were half constructed, and they just want to dump them and get rid of them. So for, I think there were some good plans for South Coatesville Borough, but, um, you know, the, well, the government doesn't. This was Worth Brothers. Worth Brothers yeah. bought the farms that became this Midville. They sold out to Midville around 1915, and Midville finished the construction of it, but... Worth Brothers owned like 3,000 houses at mm -hmm. one point. They had their own realty yeah. company. So what yeah, streets steel. would that be though? Everything um, where the South Coatesville Borough Hall is, everything mm -hmm. from there up was this. That wide boulevard, that they had the Midville Hotel sat at that one intersection when you go up right. and uh, the yeah. road splits. That's Parkway. Oh, Parkway. This is and right, yeah. it also, the street would have been Penn Avenue, Lafayette Street. Um, oh. And in that area, you now have uh, Citadel Bank. Uh, there was also previously a elementary school, mm -hmm. which was South Coastville Elementary. I think a really interesting development around here <coughs> is the Bauhaus type building just under the <coughs> VA that uh -huh. were built for co colored uh, workers. Mm -hmm. um, it's an oval built on what appears to be an old uh, horse race track. And oh. You know, east of here? Carver Court? Yeah, that's oh. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very interesting development. Uh, that's right. I don't think there was a racetrack there. Well, it, yeah. it, if you look at the old photographs from the aerial, it looks almost like an old oval that I assumed was a horse racetrack. Hmm. But you can see in the drawings for um, the 100 acres that they bought in 1915 and started to create. I mean, very much you can see Port Sunlight and some mm -hmm. of those communities. They, it's like a garden suburb kind of idea of um, attractive houses and everything. But again, g c the companies, and I will say the government, they had to build these towns rapidly because places mm -hmm. where there were steel companies or shipyards like Hog Island, they got a thousand workers in six months that had to be housed. And so they're really handicapped just by the exigencies of the war and, and trying to find, to work. yeah. And in places like and a lot of men and boys came to these areas from the Midwest or the Great Lakes states. They were going to be temporary 
Mm. They weren't going to stay here. So that raises another whole debate. How much housing are you going to build that's high quality for people who are going to leave as soon as yeah. the war's over? So that's another issue with wartime housing. Are you aware of the, uh, the company housing that the Pennsylvania Railroad built on the east end of Coatesville? It's actually no. in Cowan Township. Uh, the street that's parallel to Route 30, one block south, is that Olive? Yes. Olive Street, yes. the very east end of Olive Street. Uh, in Cowan Township, there are homes there that were built by the Pennsylvania Railroad about 1906. Okay. That served the, as the uh, workers uh, for the coal wharf that was there. That yeah. was built mm -hmm. in 1906. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's when okay. that was built, 1906? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and there's similar housing, exactly. It was Pennsylvania Railroad housing plan. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever been to Penn State, you've traveled Route 322 through the Lewistown Narrows. Mm -hmm on the railroad side of the Narrows, not the main highway side, there is housing uh, identical to it that okay. served the, uh, 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 the Cold Wharf in Denholm, which was just east, almost identical to Thorndale, but just east of the Narrows, mm -hmm. along 322. Uh, and as you go through the Narrows, too, there was a, there was an, in, the, the housing that's in there was for, uh, I can't remember the town that's there, but they, the locomotives on the track picked up water on the fly mm -hmm. between the rails and the track pans. Mm -hmm. And there was housing for the people that manned that station. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I wrote them both down. There's so many examples of worker housing around that was created by companies, and yet it's really just a few in the United States or a place as big as Gary, Indiana that have really been the focus for historians, but there's so much other local stuff in this area that nobody's ever like really researched. It brings to mind also in the Paoli rail yards. Mm -hmm. In the Paoli oh, there was yeah. there was a group of housing in there they called Wreckers Row. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the wreck crews used to live there in those houses. They were taken down many years ago. Mm -hmm. There's um, old tenement housing in Gladwin. Um, where people used to work, there was, a, there was a rifle, I don't know what it was first, but I, they talked about it once being a place where rifles were built right along Mill Creek. Okay. The Lower Marion Conservation, when they do their tour, they talk about that. Oh, and they yes, take you I to the, ten that. the tenement. Yeah, the tenement house, that's uh -huh. outstanding. Like or it's that, just a wall. That, yeah. And I, um, it was recently the really? year of the mill in Delaware County. Mm -hmm. Did No? Oh, you did know about it? Yeah. Yeah. And we went to the paper where they made Ivy Mill, where they made the paper, and there was tenement housing there. And that's part, you know, it's still, it's just a wall, but it's there now still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen that, but I've seen Kathleen Appenplatt, the conservationist there with Laura Murray and Conservancy, give a talk so about that's it. That's Gladwin, yeah. but Delaware County yeah. is the Ivy Mill, mm -hmm. where they made, they actually made currency there too. Mm -hmm. And there's still like a wall. It's the same as Gladwin, it's just a wall. It's not really anything much. Yeah. But it was so, tenement, they say, yeah. yeah. There were several rolling mills just a mile north of here, and uh, they built a lot of housing for that. And in the deeds, they called banks, uh, groups of housing for employees were all referred to as banks. Banks, banks of houses? That's what they mm -hmm. so, many so like rows, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a smart way to build. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I did see, I didn't bring a photo, and I can't remember what if it's Vandergrift, which was in, uh, near Pittsburgh. They did bring build worker housing, multifamily, like a duplex up and bottom, and they're built into the hill. So the one goes to the first floor, and what are the third and fourth stories are actually that family's first <laughs> and second floor, but the other way, it, they're like the that. It's the same so thing on um, clever. the paper, where the, it's 252, is it? It's, it's in one of these Delaware County places. It's a little museum now, but it's exactly how it is. You go on the first floor, it's down here, and up the hill you're going in the second and third floor, and there's little, like Warren, like steps everywhere in the building. It's, mm -hmm. it's a gigantic building. I can Google it and tell you what it's called. Okay. I don't remember. Yeah. They had the one picture early on in West Virginia with no uh, close to the railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Beckley, West Virginia, and there's a museum there. And just north of there, there was a town 
that had no roads at all. Mm -hmm. It was all coal mining employees, mm -hmm. and it was built into the side of the mountain down to the river, and it was so steep they had nothing but wooden sidewalks in front of each row of houses. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think sometimes, particularly the coal companies, really stuck the houses on land that they had no other use for, like just like, that's what we'll do with it. We'll build worker houses there. This is Strong kind of off topic, but I traveled through mm -hmm. Canada and, that, and I, was, I went by myself and it was, it was, I was shocked. Um, I went up this road called the Labrador, Trans Labrador Highway, which is a graded gravel, it's not even a road. And there's a town that's a mining town and you can only live in the town if you work in the mine. And um, there's a building where everything is in this one building. There's houses, but then there's another building. Everything is in the building. The stores, the school, there's like, there's a strip joint. <laughs> and, then, and then I went on the tour and I said, well, what about women? And they had the gall to say to me, this is like 15 years ago, we really don't have any need for single women here. I'm like, <gasps> it's like having a heart attack because the, what they do is they bring up, sing, there's families, but they bring up single men and then they house them in like a place. And I met a lady on the ferry on my way back and she said, when you leave the, the company, you have to leave all your friends and you have to leave your house and move away from the mine. Mm -hmm. And it's, st it's still there, like today, it's still there. Mm -hmm. It's an iron ore company. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was, for all these extractive, like lumber, uh, different kinds of mining, that was the problem. You had to leave. They're there's in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing else totally to do. Totally middle of nowhere. There's yeah. one town where you can get gas on your way there. I forget, yeah. what, uh, Labrador, I forget exactly what the name of the town is, but it's so strange to me. Yeah, um, it's very different than being in a city where you can search for another job but stay in the same they're house. They're so, like, like, brainwashed by it. The, people the, needed jobs, and mine, a lot of times they're the proud of their century, jobs. The mine company buy it pays the police officer, the teachers, everybody. Anyway, yeah. I'm a little, I was a little irate by the whole thing, but anyway, yeah. sorry. My really but there's top, really places off like that in, in Western Australia mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Well, there um, you go, Canada, Australia, <coughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. They fly you in. You work 12, 12 hours a day. Um, nephew of mine drives a truck. 12 hours a day, down to the bottom of the pit, back up, dump, back down, right. up. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of tough jobs out there. A fantastic pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I just was kind of outraged. Well, sorry. <laughs> Well, you all know how to get in touch with me if any other examples occur to you. The webpage, Westchester University History Department, you can always find me. So if you think of any other examples, please contact me. Well, Carver Court is worth looking at. I, I definitely will. Yeah. Because the flat roofs, some of the people who live there now uh, have put Everything More is regular roofs <coughs> because of the leaking. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yes, of course. She gives mm -hmm. great lectures on uh, mm -hmm. ethnicity and where. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's great. Well, thank you, Ann. We really appreciated it Good. and uh, learned a lot. And thanks to you for uh, all the additional examples that I will check out. Please join us for refreshments. Sixth Avenue for 1910, There was in Liverpool, and they destroyed it to build a, a motorway into Liverpool. But there was in the early 1970s still some back-to-back -back housing just outside of Liverpool near right adjacent to the Liverpool Manchester Railway the original 1930 Stevenson Railway and down the middle of the street